I think it's fair to say that video game adaptations haven't always had the best track record over the years. Yeah, there's been occasional gems like Arcane, Mortal Kombat, and of course, Street Fighter. Of course! But there's also been the Resident Evil movies, Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City, and Resident Evil on Netflix. <laughs> Seriously guys, how difficult is it to adapt a game series that's literally based off of B-grade horror films? Give me like one weekend and I could probably do it for you. Anyway, then along came The Last of Us on HBO, a show that I went into with no small amount of trepidation. Could it possibly hope to capture the spirit and raw emotional impact of one of the most highly regarded games of all time? Could the actors do justice to such beloved characters? Would it stay true to the original game's themes and ideas, or try to warp and alter them to make them more acceptable to modern audiences? Would it finally prove that video games are a legitimate storytelling art form on par with the best that Hollywood has to offer, or would it be just another lazy attempt to cash in on a popular franchise without understanding or respecting what made it good in the first place? Well, now that we're a few episodes in, I feel like I'm in a position to give an initial assessment of the show's merits, and my opinion so far is, well, muted appreciation for what I've seen, with a few concerns about what might be coming up. Overall, I think The Last of Us is a competent, intelligent production with good performances from a mostly capable cast, decent direction and production design, and a relatively faithful and respectful attitude towards the source material. Now, you might have noticed that the one thing I haven't said is that I personally like this show. I find myself watching it as someone might regard a slightly bland but competently made painting in some art gallery somewhere, recognising the care and skill that went into producing it, but feeling no real personal connection to the work. Or in less pretentious terms, going on a date with someone that should in theory be a perfect match for you, only to find that the vital spark of attraction just isn't quite there. It's an interesting little conundrum, and one that I'm going to try and explore further on in this review, but in order to do that, I'm going to need to offer up some kind of context for this analysis. So grab your three iron and let's tee up this plot summary. Ah! <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. So The Last of Us takes place about 20 years after an apocalyptic pandemic caused by a mutagenic mind-controlling fungus that infected most of the world's population almost overnight. Those who weren't killed in the initial outbreak were turned into decomposing, zombie-like monsters, operating as a kind of collective hive mind with no shred of their former intelligence or humanity. A bit like your average Tumblr user, only with better personal hygiene. The human survivors mostly live in fortified quarantine zones now, run by lots left of the US government, where life is harsh and supplies are scarce. However, a resistance group known as the Fireflies have been stirring up trouble, attacking convoys and bombing government facilities. Their goal is to overthrow the government and restore freedom to the quarantine zones, and the centrepiece of their plan is Ellie, a 14-year-old girl with a natural immunity to the virus. Their plan is to smuggle Ellie to a Firefly research lab on the other side of the country where they can use her to produce a vaccine, allowing humanity to finally overcome the virus and begin to rebuild civilization. And in the midst of all this shit is our main man, Joel, a cynical, middle-aged smuggler who lost his daughter on the first day of the outbreak and now exists as a hollow shell of his former self. Joel's been trying to get in touch with his brother Tommy, he's now in Wyoming, but when he fails to respond to radio calls, Joel and his partner Tess decide to head out there and find him. Unfortunately, their plan to buy one of the few remaining car batteries left in the quarantine zone goes tits up when their supplier double crosses them and they end up walking right into the middle of the Firefly operation to smuggle Ellie out of the city. It's all a bit convoluted but the gist is that now it's up to Joel and Tess to get her to the research lab instead. It doesn't work out too well for Tess though, and so begins their epic cross-country adventure through perils and challenges to deliver Ellie to a safe haven, along the way developing a father-daughter bond that ultimately gets tested to its limits. On the face of it, The Last of Us does a lot of things right, and there's definitely plenty to praise here, so let's do exactly that. Visually, it looks great. The cinematography really captures the bleak, somber, melancholy feel of a world after the collapse. A world of ruined cityscapes slowly being reclaimed by nature, where dangerous things lurk in the darkness and wreckage that was once civilization. A world of gritty, improvised settlements where the strung out remains of humanity huddle together in fortified slums, watched over by a corrupt and forgiving military dictatorship. A world of untamed wilderness fought over by raiders, survivalists and desperate outcasts. 
It's nothing that we haven't seen in other movies and TV shows, but it's all well realised and pretty faithful to the games, so well done on that score. The show also does a great job capturing that iconic opening scene of the day that the world fell apart, with all its chaos and unexplained destruction and sudden senseless tragedy. There's nothing quite so unnerving as watching the safe, normal world that you've known your whole life disintegrate around you with no clue as to what's actually happening or why. The infected themselves are also well realised, managing to stay threatening and alien without coming across as cheap or silly. If you've seen 28 Days Later then you'll be familiar with the kind of fast moving infected that rush towards you like a living tide, but the show also works in some of the more novel enemies like the clickers. Infected that are blind by normal standards but can home in on the faintest sound, meaning that your best bet is to stand your ground and hope that they pass you by. The dialogue is generally smart, economical and mature and delivered by a mostly talented cast of actors. I wasn't really sure about Pedro Pascal filling in the role of Joel, partly because he seems to be flavour of the month in Hollywood right now and I'm getting a bit tired of seeing his face in fucking everything, but even though his Texan accent comes and goes more frequently than upcoming Star Wars projects and vanishes altogether by episode 3, I think he generally turns in a good performance and does what's asked of him. It's the same deal with Anna Torv as Tess, who makes a big impression with her relatively limited screen time, and Nick Offernan delivers what may be a career best in the third episode as a lonely survivalist who finally finds someone to care about. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about Bella Ramsey as Ellie. Not only does she look nothing like Ellie from the games, which I could live with provided she could at least capture the character's personality, but she doesn't seem able to… well… Act. She's got roughly two emotions that I was able to pick up on, mild anger slash frustration and weirdly chirpy, not a care in the world good humour that's completely at odds with her situation. And her portrayal just feels so shallow and simplistic compared to the game version. The thing that made Ellie from the games so compelling was her combination of defiant hostility and innocent vulnerability. She was fiery and snarky but she was also compassionate and protective, and the more time you spent with her, the more you got to know the real person beneath and as a result, the more you came to like and care for her. This Ellie seems to have the opposite effect in that the more I see her, the more I find myself rooting for the fucking monsters. She's brash and annoying, arrogant and overconfident, consistently ignoring everything Joel says even when it's clearly the right course of action, dominating most conversations with a self-confidence that's ridiculous for someone of her age, and rarely showing any kind of fear or intimidation despite the terrifying situation she finds herself in. She has close encounters with nightmare-inducing monsters with with barely a reaction. Instead of being the junior partner of a father-daughter relationship that slowly evolves over the course of the narrative, she acts more like one of Joel's peers, interrogating him for information, acting independently in dangerous situations, insisting on being consulted during decision making, and only cooperating with him because she feels like it. All of this stuff acts as a thumb on the finely balanced scales of their relationship from the game. See, Game Ellie wasn't a survivor when you first met her. In fact, she was pretty useless when it came to the practical aspects of getting by in the world of Last of Us. Why? Because she was young and inexperienced and kind of naive about the world outside the walls. She was shocked and terrified and saddened by the things she saw and dependent on Joel to keep her safe even if she didn't particularly like him at first. Joel, on the other hand, was a hardened survivor, smart and cynical and world-weary. He trusted almost no one, had few friends, and generally treated Ellie as unwanted baggage that was slowing him down, because that's exactly what she was. He was harsh and assertive with her in the early stages and kind of a terrifying figure from her perspective because he absolutely needed to be, because that's the kind of world they were living in now. But as the story progressed, each character began to fill gaps in the other's personality. From Joel, Ellie learned self-reliance, survival skills and the confidence she needed to stand up for herself when it counted. Her arc was a coming of age story about letting go of her youthful ignorance and learning that the real world was a more complex, dangerous and morally grey place. Joel made her hard and tough enough to stand on her own two feet. And from Ellie, Joel learned compassion, protectiveness and paternal love. Because of her, he rediscovered his humanity. Each character gave something of value to the other that they needed. Here though, the relationship feels weirdly unbalanced. Ellie's depicted as confident and independent right off the bat, cool under pressure, unfazed by the sight of violence and death, able to verbally spar with Joel and more than capable of doing things for herself. There's even a cringeworthy scene where she enters a building against Joel's specific instructions, discovers a hidden basement that he apparently never noticed despite visiting the place multiple times, kills an infected without emotion and even recovers a pristine box of tampons as a bonus item. <laughs>
I mean, I get the point you're trying to make, Show. I'm just not sure it's a point that needed to be made. Like I say, all of these little elements undermine that perfectly balanced relationship dynamic from the game. Instead of two flawed people who each learn things and complete each other, now it seems more like Joel is the flawed and weak one who needs a far more capable and confident Ellie to fix him. And it reinforces my suspicion that this show is going to take its narrative cues from Last of Us Part 2. <laughs> Why is that a bad thing? Well, it's not just because it's eventually going to lead us to this big slab of beef. Hey, you <laughs> Those of us familiar with the games will remember the insidious little changes and retcons that were made to Joel and Ellie's character and relationship to justify the, uh, thing that happens to him. Joel went from being a strong, capable, cunning and ruthless survivor in the first game to a weak, naive, downtrodden sap in the second, too spineless to stand up for himself against Ellie's accusations and too stupid and tongue-tied to argue his case. He was a neutered version of his former self, altered to fit the new game's narrative. And the more I see of him, the more I suspect that's the version of Joel they're trying to work with here. He comes across as less savvy, less cunning, less in control of himself and less authoritative. He meanders through his scenes without a strong sense of purpose, allowing Ellie to act independently even if it puts her life at risk and losing control of himself in high pressure situations. He's meant to be a former soldier, but he uses guns about as effectively as a vegan yoga instructor from California. And if you pay close attention to their interactions, you'll notice that it's Ellie who dictates the tone and pace of their conversations, while Joel just seems kind of lost, always two steps behind and struggling to catch up. And all of this stuff just makes it that little bit harder for me to get invested in their relationship, because it feels like the show is trying to push it in the same counterintuitive direction as that massively divisive second game, retroactively trying to validate Neil Druckmann's creative choices. You might be smart, Neil, but you're not smart enough to get past the drinker. Interestingly enough, the only episode to really engage me on an emotional level was also the one that deviated most from the game and had almost nothing to do with Joel and Ellie, focusing instead on a pair of supporting characters who come together in the wake of the outbreak and basically live together for the next two decades. Falling in love, sharing danger and companionship, making a life for themselves, and finally growing old and choosing to face the end together with love love and dignity. It's totally pointless to the main narrative and you could argue that it's nothing but an unnecessary distraction, but it's also poignant, sensitively written and brilliantly acted. Just another forgotten story of survival and humanity in a broken world. But my point here is that when you're more invested in a pair of minor side characters than the actual protagonists of the story, that's a bit of a problem. Of course, we're only a third of the way through the series at this point, so these concerns might end up being false alarms by the end, but my bullshit sense is tingling on this one. I can see the tiny cracks starting to appear in the narrative, and these things only tend to get bigger as time goes on. As much as I hope I'm wrong on this one, I can't shake the feeling that Last of Us might be sailing into troubled waters, and that what we're seeing right now is nothing but the calm before the storm. Whether the show's able to make it out of the other side intact, only time will tell. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.